Um, on to our next uh, presenters, which is um, Winston and Sam. You've probably heard us a bit talking about joint management today and Indigenous ranger groups and stuff. And we're really lucky up here that um, we've got a, across the whole landscape, we've got a um, indigenous ranger groups who are doing really fantastic work on country. So not only keeping culture strong, but we've got a new um, workforce of people of land managers who are back on country, but also um, you know having great conservation outcomes and looking after um, their own country, which they're so passionate about. So there's been a bit of talk, you know, media and stuff about funding for indigenous ranger groups and that sort of thing. But when you actually live up here and experience it, you realise how significant it is. So it's exciting to have. Sam and Winston here today to talk about managing Garajari country where we have some of the most significant shorebird populations in Australia. So just note that we've got a change um, there where Ewan, unfortunately, we've sent him to the desert to do some work for Parks and Wildlife, but <laughs> luck luckily we've got Sam instead. So please welcome Sam and Winston um, to the stage. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Winston Shavla, and this is my coordinator, Sam Bailey. He's the IPA coordinator of Garajeti. Um, I just want to pay my respects to the Yaru countrymen, uh, also my family in the north. And thank you for having us at the 2018 BirdLife Australia Congress. I just want to share with you a <coughs> some st story of the Garajeti IPA and the Ranger program, so this is a bit sidetrack from the bird stuff, but yeah. This is approximately, oh, this is our Garajeti country. Uh, it's, um, it's approximately 32,000 square kilometers, and um, it's almost the size of Netherlands. It is made up of lots of different tenure, such as indigenous pastoral station, which Garajeti owns. And we other have like four other pastoral stations within that area. It is, it has 333 kilometers of pristine coastline. This country is managed by the Garajeti Traditional Lands Association. The KTLA was first established in 1989 and worked tirelessly to gain native title um, for that many years. So we've got a native title in 2002, 2004, and 2012. With, in the south section, there, we um, have a joint native title with Nyangamara, Nyangamara tribe in the south. And yeah, this is about the um, IPA that we have on Garajiri country. It is about 25,000 square kilometers of country that has been turned into indigenous protected area. The IPA was declared in 2014 and is classified through the United Nations IUCN protected area, category two and six. So category two is the dark green and category six is this big area. Category 2 is known as the National Park, so large natural or near natural areas set aside to protect large scale ecological processes along with a complement of species and ecosystems characteristics of the area, which also provide a foundation for environmentally, culturally compatible, spiritual, scientific, educational, recreational and visitor opportunities. Category 6 protected area with sustainable use of natural resources, protected areas that conserve ecosystems and habitats, together with associated cultural values and traditional natural resource management systems. They are generally large with most of the area in a natural condition where proportion is under sustainable natural resource management and where now le low level non-industrial use of natural resources compatible with nature conservation, as it's one of the main aims of the area. <clears throat> this slide talks about the uh, partnerships we have with Parks and Wildlife, uh, also known as DBCA. So some of the areas uh, are nature reserves and conservation estates. So at the bottom is uh, known as Walyara Conservation Park. 
So that's a salt creek just merely on the edge of the desert and coast. And in the desert is a Dragon Tree Nature Reserve. We, we have a garage, a garage name for the place, so that's Guriji by Yajala, which is named after the two soaks that's within that area. And this long stretch here is the 80 Mile Beach Marine Park and Terrestrial Reserve. So that's where we do a lot of our close work with the Department of Parks and Wildlife on um, shorebirds and invertebrate species. Who are we? Uh, this is a bit of a background of my people and our culture. So Garajati means facing west. So Gara Jari, Gara is west and Jari is face. We have three dialects. Naja is coast, Naru is central, and Nangu is desert. We have six seasons in our Gara Jari as well. So they are known as Mangala, Marul, Weralburu, Laja, Wilburu, and Bargana. Gara Jari Bugatti story, Bugatti means dream time, are important to our range of work as this helped manage and sustain our knowledge as well as putting to use into our work plan. For example, we have one of our projects that's being discussed on the Salmon Place. So Salmon Place is a dreaming to Garajari. It is a very important cultural site on the coast where Garajari people harvest for food for many years until today. There has been, however, there has been unidentifiable changes to the harvest of uh, natural resources, a bush tucker, like because of um, seasonal, like the uh, climate change and on our country, the sea level rising and the terrain changes at one of these places. All of our um, <clears throat> land and sea management work comes from this book. So this book is uh, it's like a guide for us. So we call, it's, a, it's a management plan, but also known as a healthy country plan. So it was first launched in May 2014, alongside the IPA declaration. This management plan was created by the Garajati community over several years of consultation. <clears throat> so Garajati IPA and Ranger team. We have various funding streams and partnerships. These are working on country program that the uh, federal government uh, funds. We have the IPA program, which is also a federal funded, pro funded program as well. The Aboriginal Ranger program is a state funding from WA Labor Party. Uh, partnerships we have closely with Ernst & Young, Indigenous Land Corporation, University of Western Australia, Environs Kimberley, Tourism WA, um, Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attraction, and we have also a uh, now new partner with Google as well. <laughs> yeah, so interesting <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so our ranger team, we have at least uh, eight full-time rangers, two school-based trainees, working two days a week, two casuals, so that makes us up, up, up to like 12 ranges total. We also have a three coordinators, which is Sam is one of them, and we have a women's coordinator and the ranger coordinator. We have a cultural officer who focuses on the cultural side of, of ranger work. He's my grandfather, and he's not in this photo, however, but yeah, he's, he really focuses on that area. And we have one administration support. This is this photo, is, I think, is really recognizable because it was in the um, West Australian website um, newspaper article, and it was also on the Country Needs People campaign as well. Um, on the left is my sister, elderly sister. I say Gabuju in my Garajiri language, and on the right is my Jalbi. So in Garajiri, I call niece, or how in the white man's way, I call a great grandmother. So yeah, they're the eldest, and they're also one of our leading expertise on Garajari country, especially when it comes to ranger work. They play a vital role for us 
on working on country, they, as they give us guidance and support of what we do. They hold the important knowledge of Garajeri customary and traditional practices. So going on to some of our work, the threatened species, <coughs> the threatened species within the IPA, we looked at uh, the bilby, we call it the jiraru. And, <coughs> sorry, and we, ha um, we found more sightings occurring in the Kimberleys, and we work closely with uh, Environs Kimberley and Kimberley Land Council to take long, you know, to find out where bilbies were living in the Kimberley region. Um, the bilby has been found throughout the desert and coastal, as we found a few, or not, a lot of sightings actually, on uh, 80 Mile Beach in the coast, which is uh, strange to find them occurring there. So we've done a lot of um, work where we pivoted part of the large range level two populations have uncovered these bilby sightings. This saw rangers working side by side with Department of Parks and Wildlife staff to complete DNA and population surveys at these sites. One of the sites, which is the um, Anna Plains um, area, is, uh, has the largest population of bilbies in WA and could be maybe in Australia, but we don't know that. This map shows um, the Bilby Plus that we carried out um, last year and this year. Yeah, we've done about 200 and I say 13 or 20, um, mainly along the coast and in the center. And this year we've worked um, early in uh, March with uh, Bruce and Edgar Ranges there. We've looked for Bilby sightings as well. So yeah, we've carried out like a two hectare plot for two years just to find out if these bilbies are living in our country. Although the night parrot hasn't been found within our IPA yet. <laughs> but with the you know, help with um, some of the experts like Bruce and Nigel to help leading this, um, you know, this project is it's a really good outcome if they do exist there we were on, our, on our side of the boundary. Um, yeah, we're you know, using some of the technology and equipment to help capture the calls of the uh, night parrot. Is, you know, it's a really useful tool to know if they exist within our area. Our project partners like Environs Kimberley, um, we've done a trip to Yilby in the north, which is Edgar Ranges, and we've looked at really old um, spin effects, which is supposed to be like 40 years old. And this is one of the areas that you know could could potentially hold um, uh, the night parrot, but unfortunately we didn't find any sightings. But they could be there somewhere. Um, yeah, we've all early. I think. Oh, what happened there? I think I turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think uh, this year in February uh, we worked closely with Chris Hassel and the uh, Global Flyway Network on its annual shorebird expedition at 80 Mile Beach, which is Anna Plains. Um, this helps, you know, it's, it is always a popular yet unpopular trip due to uh, ex extreme heat and humidity and phonetic pace, <laughs> but you know, coming together of so many lovely and dedicated people from around the world coming to Garajit country is very, very special to us. In addition to shorebirds, we have annual work plan with Department of Biodiversity and Conservation to help manage the park. Um, we've also, in the past, have other activities like the invertebrate, uh, benthic invertebrate surveys, and of course, the uh, flatbird turtle. We've helped um, Department of Parks and Wildlife, you know, to assist them in collecting important nesting data of the flatback, as well as taking the turtle to understand and monitor the movement across the Kimberleys. Um, we start 
uh, working on the flatback turtle ending of the year annually um, from November to December. This is one of my favorite photos on the right hand side. It looks like he's taking a selfie. <laughs> That's the uh, spectacle head wallaby. Um, as the spectacle head wallaby is listed on the EPBC Act as vulnerable. However, the little documented information about this species needs more work to fully understand its status in the Kimberley. In 2017, Garajeti partnered with Yaru and WWF on Yaru Country to undertake camera trapping to learn more about this species. Yaru Country managers shared information about wallaby signs, including scats, tracks, and preferred habitat, as well as setting cameras. Garajeti have now since done some camera trapping in the north of our IPA with, some, with cameras deployed for nine weeks to see if we could capture spectacular wallabies within the Garajeti landscape. A good result eventuated with three of the 20 cameras deployed capturing images of wallabies. We are continuing to partner with Yaro and WWF and will be looking to process data using eMammal, which is this tool website. I think is accessed by the internet. Um, yes, yeah, it is a tool for collecting, archiving, and sharing camera trapping images and data. We've also attended the um, Ecological Society of Australia, and I think um, it was in the middle of this year, I went to Brisbane, and I gave a talk on some of the Bilby stuff and a bit of on the Spectacle Head Wallaby about the project that we've done with um, WWF and Depot. So going on to some of our fire stuff, um, I think Sam is going to talk about this. So, yeah. <laughs> I should just let him keep going, I think. <laughs> um, thank you, Winston. So, um, yeah, so one of the, an exciting part of our, um, our work is fire. And uh, <clears throat> we all know that good fire work done early in the year and across multiple years promotes strong biodiversity outcomes. We know bilbies enjoy a wide variety of food spanning different fire ages. Night parrots live amongst the 100-year-old spinifex and, and um, spectacled hair wallabies like three-year-old plus tuss tussock grasslands to build shelters in. So Garajari is really trying to build its capacity to manage and plan for fire. And the range, we're one of the few ranger groups in the Kimberley now that actually do the fire planning, um, do all the training in the uh, navigational aircraft, incendiary machine operating training, and on-ground burning operations. Um, this year we were starting to think, uh, we've kind of, we sort of did some um, sort of uh, thinking about how we've been doing burning, and we realised we kind of just sort of someone was to ask us, is our burning leading to any good biodiversity outcomes, we couldn't really tell them with any certainty. So we're starting to plan a, a five-year biodiversity and, and fire project. And it's in its early stages, but we're looking at to uh, put monitoring sites throughout the desert with the help of our project partners at Parks and Wildlife, Environs Kimberley, Bush Heritage, the Nature Conservancy, and the National Environment Science Program, NESP. Um, so we're really trying to bring in a lot of partners to help us with this big, big project. The rangers, this year the rangers will see, will work in different landscapes and across ecological communities to understand what fire does and how to establish a finer scale burning practice and tailor our burning practice around what we see. We hope this will have added, added outcomes like being um, ready for the carbon market when, when and if Garajari can enter that. We want to try and build some independence, so having great partners is, is fantastic but we really, really want to you saw the size of Garajari country, the size of the Netherlands. We need to start to build our own capacity as an independent group. And all the old people keep telling the rangers and myself that we can't do everything from helicopters. We need to be out on the ground, learning from the old people, learning from our partners, and making sure that the young people are getting out and about as well. So that's, that was some really good tips, because we were getting a bit carried away with just being in choppers and planes. Um, recently, we've teamed up with our next door neighbour, the Nordura Rangers, and this is all of their country here. And so we, we submitted a joint project with uh, the Aboriginal Ranger Program funding with an area over 110,000 square kilometres to start looking at fire across this big landscape and trying to really tailor our planning to, and monitor so we can see what sort of biodiversity outcomes that we get 
So it's a really exciting program and um, the state government had, have taken notice of that and given us money to employ two rangers each, so four rangers for the next three years and um, we're really excited about just, this year we're just getting our ducks lined up but hopefully next year we'll start to really see a lot more fire and a lot more biodiversity monitoring in the desert. A um, bit of a boring slide but I think um, it's important, you know, we, we, we have a management plan but we don't take time to sit down and review it. So this year we took a review, undertook a review of, our, of our monitoring plan and started to look at, uh, give ourselves scoring on how our strategies and objectives have been going, whether we've been achieving what we set out to do. We, um, uh, a lot of the management plans in the Kimberleys sit on the shelves and we don't, they, they don't get operationalised, so we're trying to really look at how we can do that. So we have been getting some help with that, which is trying to get more professional in what we do. Um, one of the tools that we've recently discovered through the aid of a partner is um, to see whether we're doing a good job is desktop analysis of our fireworks. So this is done by Firescape um, Science and they can start they can, looking at NAFI and satellite technology, they can start giving us a sort of traffic light system on how we've been going with our burning program. And um, you know, they give us various scores and you know, as you can see from there, we've got lots of room for improvement, but it's a good it's a good point in time to be able to look back and say, okay, we're doing better at our job. Um, you have a lot of scientists probably in the room, so you're probably saying, how do you get that? How do you get those scores? And and so there's a lot of scientists, science that sits behind that. So they look at lots of little metrics like annual number of fire scars, the average size of fire scars, the largest and the smallest, um, the proportion of unburnt country to burnt country. So there's lots of different metrics that goes into this traffic light system, but this is a great new tool that rangers have to assess their firework, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, we've also got um, an online database that we use uh, every day with our work, so this is a, a place for us to store our biodiversity um, information. We can do a search for the Jitteroo, the Bilby, and come up all the places that we've found it. We put our ranger work in there, so we have a calendar of um, events and we assign resources to that. So just wanted to show you that a lot of the ranger groups um, are getting quite sophisticated in how they um, work on the ground and how we manage our resources and it's these kind of online databases are really useful when we have rangers in remote locations and managers in head office. So um, yeah, this is, and we have also been able to spit out um, animal and, and plant data to create little booklets. Um, we didn't bring any, but um, we recently did a um, one on sea critters. So a shout out to Jane Prince from UWA. Um, you know, we've been working with them, and so we've got a little booklet on the sea critters that we've found in our intertidal um, reef. So that's been really useful as well. Um, yeah, another, I guess for a lot of you who aren't from the Kimberley and you maybe don't know much about the Ranger program, but when I first started in 2009, there was probably about seven or eight ranger groups. There's now about 15 or 16 in the Kimberley, and they're now, we're now starting to network, and one of the great new networks is the Saltwater Managers Network. So this is where all the saltwater ranger groups come together and talk about similar issues, and some of those issues, a lot of those issues are around threatened species, including um, shorebirds, um, turtles, dugongs, things like that. So there's a lot more networking going on now, and we're trying to share resources and collaborate, and, and especially share data and trying to get rangers using the same monitoring techniques when they're working on in landscapes so we can pull that data together and, and make, make use of that. So this is the Kimberley Saltwater Managers Network. Um, now, is Chris McCormack in the room? He's not, not here. I, we're just about finished, but we wanted to show a little video from Chris McCormack. He's a really talented um, filmmaker and has a website called um, What's it called again? Um, excuse me. Uh, Remember the Wild. And um, he made this little video when he was down, when we're, the rangers were down at 80 Mile Beach. So I'd just like to finish off our presentation with this little video, and then we'll be happy to take some questions. So here goes.
I'm a guy in Iranian from Iranian. My name is Lynette Woolrich. Um, I come from the Iranian Aboriginal community. And we work alongside Nyamabara Rangers for the shared country in Yaunya. And we do a little bit of turtle monitoring. And now at this time of the year, we do um, bird tagging and releasing. <coughs> Uh, we're working alongside researchers and getting different knowledge from them so we can continue our work with different species of birds. My favorite part of the Ranger program is working alongside fam families and countrymen from the same community as me and learning more about culture really and getting more connected with the land. Being a ranger is, is a really special thing for me because I just want to look after animals, native animals, native plants. Every animal has a, have a heart. Everything breathes, you know, even the trees, you know, even native animals, even native birds, native, native plants, you know, they breathe, they breathe in. So it's, it's about time we need to stop them and understand the land more. It makes me feel good knowing that we're walking on a land that our ancestors walked on for thousands of years and still caring for country. Working on land again on my country has made me proud of what I do and what I do for my people because end of the day I gotta pass this knowledge to the young generation. Tear jacker, but <laughs> but uh, well, we have any questions for Sam and Winston? Really, just a question about uh, feral animals in your area and feral animal control. Is that a big, big issue? Um, yeah, especially the um, feral cats that we get on in our area. I think it's widely across Australia the cat has impacted on the bilby, for example, and is it's just uh, causing a lot of you know damages to our wildlife, and um, as well as the uh, cattle and the camels on some of our water, um, uh, one of our springs and soaks as well. So. We've done a lot of monitoring and to find, uh, especially with our depot on some of the projects that at, you know looking at uh, feral animals. So yes, one of the um, one of our important um, jobs to really to decrease the um, you know the invasive species and impacts that the um, these feral animals are causing on our country. Well, we, we couldn't get to a lot of places, as you know, it, was, it took a long time to be able to access country this year. I think even some places we couldn't get out till, till late May, 
so there's still some springs we still can't get to. I mean, this last wet season was a real, was, uh, was a very crazy wet season with so much rain. We had three times the annual rainfall in, in some places. Um, but I haven't noticed, I haven't heard anyone talk about differences. Maybe that we're still, still to come noticing the, those differences. Do you, do you know any? Yeah, I remember the last year that we didn't, I never didn't see many brogas on the on the coastal plains, but I noticed that them, there's a lot more this year. So, not sure what else. Yes, sir. Uh, just Winston was talking about looking for bilbies. I just wondered if they found any. Uh, yeah, we found found across the whole area of um, of our native tile boundary. We went from the desert to this uh, to the centre of a native tile to the coast, and we found some, found many sightings of bilbies, in a, especially in the southern section of a native tile across to the um, Anna Plains boundary. And we've discovered, I think, I think it's five families of um, bilby population in the whole of our native tile area. So yeah, it was really interesting to know that Um, well, we do have a we do have one little area of country that um, that we invite tourists to, and that's ports around Portsmouth and Gordon Bay. So we have um, a little tourism um, area there that people can go to and, and enjoy. It's really if you haven't been there, it's one of the most underrated coastal areas in Australia for real. But um, but that's an interesting question. One of we there is an initiative called the Ten Deserts Project, where all the indigenous desert groups from across Australia have come together and formed an alliance it's called the Indigenous Desert Alliance and it's, they've just received a lot of funding from BHP and one of the projects is on how to promote tourism in the desert and so we got some money with that so we are looking at trying to come up with a pilot program where we get people like yourselves or people who are into sort of conservation and have an earth watch style program where we get um, maybe eight or nine, ten um, people to come out with us in the desert to do some bio, um, biodiversity work. And so we give them a cultural experience. They help us with our biodiversity work. We have an expert or two experts out there guiding the project. So we, I mean, package it all up. So um, that's definitely on the cards and you'll probably see something over the next year or two on that. So good question. Well, I think that'll do for Sam and Winston.